good afternoon. It's 12 noon and welcome to the Korea Society. We're delighted to have so many friends and supporters here today uh, to listen to Professor Terence Rorick talk about uh, his book, Japan, South Korea, and the United States Nuclear Umbrella Deterrence After the Cold War. I'd like to begin before uh, turning to Terry by also acknowledging a few of our kind supporters in the room. Uh, we have uh, two of our members of the board here today. Uh, we have uh, Phil Sherman here in the front row, who has been a kind supporter through our Sherman Scholar program, as well as Nicholas Bratt. Uh, thank you both for coming. And we also have back with us Dr. Katrin Katz, who was the inaugural recipient of our Sherman Scholar Prize, which recognizes emerging thought leadership on Korea in the United States. So welcome back. Uh, we have today, I think, fascinating discussion, especially given the current news cycle and what has happened over the course of this year by way of negotiation aimed at denuclearization. And uh, Terry, your book is a, a wonderful read, which, by the way, is on sale here for those of you in attendance. And it's uh, uh, very fluid, uh, probably the first, I think, that, that really tackles deterrence theory alongside some, some really interesting observations on where Korea, Japan, and the United States are relative to this. Uh, and some things have happened since publication of the book that I, I think uh, probably point us in new directions, maybe most recently the, the INF uh, issue and, and whether, as it seems, the White House will withdraw. So uh, maybe with that as a backdrop, uh, you know, welcome back to the Korea Society. And uh, if you could help guide us through the book and its structure and, and uh, what you've aimed to do here. Sure. Thank you very much. And, and thank you for the invitation to be here at the Korea Society. I do have to preface this by saying these remarks are my personal views only and are not the US government or the Navy's. This project looks at the nuclear umbrella for both Japan and South Korea. And I think that's important because in many respects, while they are two separate bilateral alliances, they are linked in many respects. The US security commitment for both is linked as part of a broader regional architecture as well. Certainly, as, as you suggest, over the last several months, one might think this is not all that important anymore, as, as we maybe are moving towards a new era in uh, Korean relations, security on the Korean Peninsula. And I hope that's the case. But I would also say that I think a lot still needs to be dealt with. There are a lot of, of issues that are unsettled yet. Um, but also I think that when you look at the nuclear umbrella for Japan and South Korea, there are some different elements to that for those two countries. For South Korea's case, certainly it was much more focused on the North Korea threat. But for Japan, North Korea is certainly the immediate threat, and, and Japanese analysts still believe that's the case and are, are concerned about where some of this is going, that it's perhaps too optimistic in what can be done in regards to dealing with, with North Korea. But for Japan, the nuclear umbrella also is very importantly part of its security relationship with China. And so the nuclear umbrella has links there. Uh, certainly South Korea has a very different perspective of China than the Japanese do. But the central argument of the book, as I, I work through, I, I look at the history, um, I couch it in terms of, of deterrence theory and some of the elements of extended deterrence. And I look at historically what the nuclear umbrella was like and such, and I can talk about that a little bit later. Uh, I walk through the threat and then how this fits with the security planning for both countries. And in the end, my conclusion is that I think it's very unlikely that the United States will ever use nuclear weapons to defend South Korea or Japan. I think that there are a number of reasons why that's a problem uh, in the case of either North Korea or China. And that I think instead, it doesn't mean that the alliance is not credible and the United States will not be there to defend its allies. But I think it's much more likely that it will use conventional weapons, which can have the same strategic effect uh, 
in many instances as nuclear weapons without crossing nuclear lines. Um, and the nuclear umbrella remains an important political signal to these allies and an important non-proliferation tool for the United States because that helps to keep South Korea and Japan from going nuclear themselves. A controversial argument, I understand. I, as the book has been reviewed, I've been critiqued on both sides of the issue. Um, some who say I don't go far enough in dismissing the relevance and use of the nuclear umbrella. Others say I go way too far. Uh, one review said that, uh, well, he teaches at the Naval War College. He can't be a pacifist, um, but yet he sounds like one. Um, so I think from what my view is of the nuclear umbrella, politically, militarily, that tells me I think I've hit the spot I intended to hit in that regard. Yeah, very good. Um, maybe we can begin with a, with a basic definition of deterrence, too. And, and if you can guide us through, as you do in the book, why there was a placement of, of tactical nuclear weapons, in the case of Korea, as you point out, from, from 1958 to 1991. Sure. Deterrence its basic definition that you seek to uh, convince another state from taking an action you don't want them to take. And of course, in the Korean context, that becomes full speed after the Korean War ends and a belief that the United States needs to put in place a more robust uh, deterrence guarantee for South Korea's security. Now, there's an important distinction between extended deterrence and what's, what's called in the literature primary deterrence, where if I'm trying to deter an attack against myself, that's one thing, but when I'm trying to deter an attack against an ally, that becomes more difficult because the credibility issues are harder to demonstrate. Will I truly come to the defense of an ally when I know it may cost something um, for myself? And so those get to be more difficult. Part of that story in the nuclear piece is that the United States put in place an extended deterrence commitment that is including the nuclear umbrella, but much more than that. You will often hear in the literature folks talking about extended deterrence and making the assumption that that means nuclear weapons. That's not necessarily the case. Extended deterrence means preventing an attack on an ally. But in the United States case, there was essentially four parts to that. One, a formal security treaty, economic and military aid to try to buttress South Korea's own capability and demonstrate the United States' commitment to this ally. The stationing of U.S. combat troops, in this case, two full combat divisions in the early days, deployed close to the DMZ along the likely invasion routes to discourage North, a North Korean attack. If they were going to cross again, they would come in contact with U.S. forces. There would be U.S. casualties. That would act as a tripwire. The fourth piece, and again, I, I want to emphasize that, that extended deterrence is not just about nuclear weapons, but there was a nuclear piece to this. And so starting in 1958, the United States deployed tactical nuclear weapons to South Korea. They were present for a couple of different reasons. Uh, one, to be able to match any North Korean personnel advantage that they might have, to be able to stop an attack before it got to Seoul. You couldn't let this happen like the Korean War and have the city be overrun again. Um, there also was an indication, certainly this was part of the Cold War thinking, that tactical nuclear weapons meant that any conventional conflict could escalate potentially to a nuclear conflict, and therefore that would add another sort of brick in this wall of ensuring deterrence. Um, but eventually it became clear to many analysts and U.S. military officials that nuclear weapons to be used as a war fighting tool would have to be deployed close to the, the battle lines, and that made them dangerous to be overrun. And that given U.S. conventional capabilities, they were not necessary. And so in 1991, the United States pulled out its tactical nuclear weapons from South Korea, but still continues to maintain, and every year, and we should be coming up shortly on the renewal of this, we have what's called the Security Consultative Meeting, which rotates between Korea and the United States, where 
the defense ministers and also the high-level military officials meet to talk about security issues. In the joint communique that is produced from that ever since 1978, there is a statement there that references South Korea being under the U.S. nuclear umbrella. Mm -hmm. And remind us then in 1991, the impetus for the withdrawal of that and the basic agreement and denuclearization accord, uh, which some of us in the room who might not have been focusing on Korean sure. Peninsula at that time. Yes, right? and, and I think it's important to put that in the broader context of the end of the Cold War, that this was also, I mean, at, at, for the Korean angle of this, this was, you know, the start of some of the concerns for North Korean nuclear weapons. Uh, North Korea complaining that, well, we wouldn't need to have these if it weren't for the hostile policy and we need to develop these, et cetera. So a sense of, well, let's, let's meet that and, and call the North Koreans on this and we will pull our nuclear weapons. But it was also a part of a larger Cold War effort that as the Soviet Union was breaking up, that we were concerned about Soviet tactical nuclear weapons deployed to different Soviet republics. And we hope that this would encourage Gorbachev to rein in Soviet nuclear weapons so that they wouldn't perhaps get lost in, in the events that follow. And so it was part of the Cold War, part of the Soviet Union, but also part of Korean security as well. Mm -hmm. and, and digest this for us in relative to where we were in 94 with the nu first nuclear crisis, then from 2006, North Korea begins testing and, and sort of the relative importance of nuclear umbrella over this period. And then to today, where we're in a period of negotiation where the North Koreans very explicitly mention the nuclear umbrella as a point for their concern and the rationale for their deterrent capability. Sure. And certainly you have seen, as you follow the history of, of North Korean testing, that many times when, certainly when the first test happened in 2006 and again in 2009, the United States, the administrations were very quick to tell Tokyo and Seoul, um, you know, the nuclear umbrella is still in place. The United States will use all of its capabilities. And I'm paraphrasing a bit how Secretary Rice said, and I emphasize all capabilities to assume that that meant nuclear weapons, that you were still under the nuclear umbrella of the United States. As we move forward, this is one of the interesting elements as these negotiations perhaps progress with North Korea to look at what many are, are arguing as one of the fundamental questions here is, do both sides have the same definition of what denuclearization means? And so from a United States perspective, does that mean North Korea gives up it, its nuclear capability in a complete and verifiable manner? Or does North Korea also assume that that means, you know, perhaps the withdrawal of the nuclear umbrella? Uh, some have suggested North Korea may insist on the withdrawal of U.S. troops. Could there be some push to have North Korea insist on the U.S. nuclear arsenal writ large move in some direction to drawing down? I, I don't think we know the, the answers to that, and that's why I think it is important that we continue this dialogue. I remain somewhat skeptical that we will get to denuclearization for a number of different reasons, but I think we have to try. I think it's worth the effort to see how far we can get, what kinds of limits we can get, and certainly if we can improve peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula, that will be an achievement in its own right, certainly when you compare it to where we were last year sure, at this particular sure. time. Sure. D d dramatic. In, in a year where early on we were talking about bloody nose and the likelihood of a, a military strike. And as you point out in the book, you know, there is real questions about what happens uh, in terms of retaliation, uh, you know, whether you talk about conventional or, or whether the the perception of of a nuclear umbrella bears uh, you know concern for those who are on the other side, the um, uh, week is interesting in that we've had this meeting between Abe and Xi Jinping now, and so clearly there's a message uh, about some improvement in in Sino Japanese relations uh, at a time when Sino U.S. relations are, are at a nadir or at least a very bad point. Um, 
How do you look at the complex of where Japan is going? Our friend Brad Glosserman from uh, formerly of Pacific Forum wrote a very interesting piece that some analysts have uh, noted this week about a plan C, meaning that plan A is Japan essentially relying on the United States as it has uh, as, as a treaty partner, but plan, plan B being one where it's uh, moving more toward China, at least in terms of practical day-to-day -day and, and the reality of having to co-share power, as it were, and, and a Plan C that, that looks much more independent. And, and you arrive at this point about concerns of independent autonomous capabilities, both in Japan and South Korea, and, and clearly there are vocal minorities in both places that are, are pushing for that, which caused some of us to be concerned about potential for an arms race. Yes. I I think it's, it's been fascinating to watch how Prime Minister Abe has, has the directions he has gone over the last number of years. And I think that you are seeing a couple of things that you have, have reflected. I think one, not only in Japan, but in other corners of the Asia Pacific region and elsewhere, there is a question about US reliability, not only capabilities and the resiliency of, say, the U.S. as a global power, as a global actor. Also concerns about the will of the United States to do those things. I think there are also concerns about the strategic environment and how that evolves. And so my sense of Japan is that when you look at certainly their formal documents, it is still very much that the, the centerpiece of the U.S.-Japan alliance is, is present. I mean, that is, that is, I think, very important. But I think it's very clear that, that Japan is, is hedging its bets a little bit, not only by um, building and working on perhaps some of its own capabilities, but I think there are still some limits to that economically and in, in, in domestic politics. But also you see Japan reaching out to a number of different quarters within the region as it seeks to grow relations with Southeast Asia, with India. Um, you even saw South Korea go and build, um, President Moon travel to India and trying to build that relationship. I also, I mean, as I, as I see that trip, uh, was interesting. I mean, you th you look at it as a from a strategic perspective. I think that's also a reflection of how China, in my view, overplayed its hand on the Thad issue, mm -hmm. and this is South Korea seeking some other economic partners as well as strategic partners that reduces its reliance on China economically and otherwise. But again, in regards to Japan, I think there is some uncertainty, not only in Japan, but throughout the region about how some of these things will play out and trying to, um, again, not put all your eggs in, in one basket, if you mm -hmm. will. Uh, how, aside from, from President Moon's more muscular and expansive diplomacy that we've seen of late, uh, how do you look at Seoul in terms of what last year, when things were much more tense, uh, were calls for at least, again, in some quarters of vocal minority, uh, a push towards autonomous capability, a, a call for reintroduction of tactical nuclear weapons at one point. Uh, again, acknowledging that we're in a very different place right now, but that doesn't mean that it was so long ago we were hearing these sure, suggestions. Sure. And depending on how all of this plays out in the future, uh, you know, we could end up back in this place. Not that any of us necessarily hopes that's the case, but... Um, certainly there have been calls among conservatives in South Korea in particular for either the redeployment of U.S. tactical nuclear weapons or to, to put it in the context of making a threat to do that, to try to get China to do more, again, last year and, and prior to that, to do more to constrain North Korean behavior and North Korean uh, nuclear ambitions. If that's not going to work, and, and it's interesting, I suppose when I was doing the research for this book, my sense was that it was very unlikely the United States would be willing to reintroduce tactical nuclear weapons. I still think that's the case, but that may be less of a certainty over the last, well, last year. I, I, 
I came across some inklings that maybe that would have been something that at least was being talked about in the administration. Then certainly there are some who have suggested, as, as I think one quote I have in the book is that uh, a South Korean politician talked about the nuclear umbrella being very fragile. <laughs> and so maybe South Korea needs its own nuclear capability. South Korea could certainly build its own nuclear weapons and has tried in the past. We had this mm -hmm. issue in the 1970s where we eventually found out that South Korea was working on its own nuclear capability, twisted South Korea's arm to back away from that. And so South Korea has a very robust civilian nuclear energy capability that could certainly turn to nuclear weapons if it chose to do so. But I think it is very clear that South Korea would pay a very significant price if it did that. Uh, there would be repercussions in regards to its civilian nuclear program and limits to its access to technology. Certainly, again, in the atmosphere from last year, after trying to engineer all sorts of international pressure on North Korea and trying to promote a nuclear-free Korean peninsula, to build its own nuclear weapons would be very harmful to that. It would make it very difficult then to put pressure on China and Russia to impose sanctions. Uh, for a number of reasons, it would, I think, have been very costly for South Korea. And I don't think it would have added much at all to South Korea's security. So you would have taken on all sorts of costs, politically, economically, and really not gained much for its own security. And so I think it's very unlikely South Korea will go in that direction. Certainly under this administration, mm -hmm. President Moon has said he's not interested in bringing back tactical nukes mm -hmm. or building their own nuclear weapons. So this issue is, is off the table, at least for the time being. But certainly, you know, as we have seen in, in our democracy, you can have elections that bring in um, different viewpoints into power. If um, in a future South Korean election, you could have a number of these things change because there certainly are many conservatives in South Korea that are unhappy with the direction that things have gone, that President Moon has gone too far, too fast, and hasn't really yet addressed the denuclearization issue. Sure. Um, Terry, if I can close on a leadership sure. question, because I think a lot of what you get to and what you've just suggested, uh, in particular in the, the answer before last, uh, is a question about U.S. reliability. I think there are lessons to be taken away, and I like your book very much in partnership with Power Play by Victor Chobb. Both of you came out of the same series for, with Columbia University Press, uh, and I find them both incredibly useful and, and insightful. Um, what do you think, uh, working with senior military leaders and, and understanding that level of engagement and thinking, should be the way that we look at leadership and American role uh, relative to this and this history and relative to, in particular, the U.S. ROK alliance and how should we be developing approaches that provide assurances and uh, broaden some of your findings, I think, in, in interesting and very practical ways. Yes. I, I like to put that question often in sort of a broader context of th this is a relationship that has lasted over 60 years. And any relationship that lasts that long is going to have times when there are frictions and require constant dialogue and discussion about issues that are of concern between both parties. We've had this in the past. We're in one now, and certainly that's not to downplay that there are some significant issues here. But I think that the, the advice I would provide is that we have to be more strategic in how we approach our relationship with South Korea and look at how there are multiple facets here that I think we have not done a very good job in regards to alliance management. And let me cite a couple of examples. I think the way we went about dealing with the free trade agreement was problematic. I think that undercut some of the levels of trust. Not that there aren't issues to be dealt with, but how it was dealt with I think is, is concerning. We are in the midst right now of negotiations for another burden sharing agreement. They're called special measures, special measures agreements, SMAs. They are five-year agreements. 
The current one expires at the end of this year. South Korea, we have exerted a good deal of pressure on South Korea to increase its contributions in the past one, and they have done that and got it to about, I believe, 49% or so. There's a good deal of pressure to increase that amount. And the number I, I heard recently in the press is that we want the South Koreans to increase their contribution to 50%. And suggestions that maybe we would even pull our troops out. I think we have to think very carefully about how we do that. Burden sharing, certainly those issues are important and we need to look at these from a U.S. perspective, from U.S. national interests. But these alliances are also important for the United States as well. And I think one of the misunderstandings sometimes that folks have about these relationships, not only with Japan, excuse me, but also with South Korea, is that, well, let's just pull these troops out and then we're going to save all sorts of money. Well, unless you decommission these units, now instead of having an ally pay for half, you're now on the hook for all of these. Mm -hmm. And I think you need to look more broadly at the, at the larger strategic picture in the region, U.S. presence. Um, it's not you know, just about those narrow relationships. And so I think we need to be careful and think more strategically about that. I would say one other example, I think we need to work with our allies when we talk about suspending exercises and possibly pulling U.S. forces out. I think that that's a discussion that has to happen at the alliance level first mm -hmm. before we start suggesting those things in public without um, that sort of collaboration. But certainly those things can be talked about. That's all stuff that needs to be addressed, but it needs to be done in a in a careful way, in my view. Terry, thank you for your frankness. And, and you've asked many good questions, as well as provided some wonderful answers. We're grateful for your time, for your coming in from the Naval War College. And we're grateful to all of you in the audience. Uh, I'd appreciate it if you take your time, take a, a few moments to fill out the evaluation form. You can hand those to one of our interns or Jonathan in the back. Uh, for those of you streaming online or listening via podcast or viewing via YouTube video, uh, we would invite you to join the Korea Society at koreasociety.org and uh, find more information on upcoming programs there. We do have a very interesting program on North Korea coming up on October 30th that I would encourage you to please come back and see us at. Uh, but Terry, thank you again, and thank you to all thank of you, you for your time and commitment. Thank you.